Greetings, made to last forever. God has planted eternity in the human heart. Ecclesiastes 3, full colon 11. Surely God would not have created such a being as man to exist only for a day. No, no, man was made for immortality. Abraham Lincoln. This life is not at all there is not all there is. Life on earth is just the dress rehearsal before the real production. You will spend far more time on the other side of death. In eternity, uh, in eternity than you will here. Earth is the staging area, the preschool, the tryout for your life in eternity. It is the practice workout before the actual game, the warm-up lap before the race begins. This life is pre preparation for the next. At most, you will live a hundred years on earth, but you will spend forever in eternity. Your time on earth is, as Sir Thomas Brown said, but a small parenthesis in eternity. You were made to last forever. The Bible says, God has planted eternity in the human heart. You have an inborn instinct that longs for immortality. This is because God designed you in his image to live for eternity, even though we know everyone eventually dies, death always seems unnatural and unfair. The reason we feel we should live forever is that God wired our brains with, this, with that desire. One day your heart will stop beating. That will be the end of your body and your time on earth, but it will not be the end of you. Your earthly body is just a temporary residence for your spirit. The Bible calls your earthly body a tent, but refers to your future body as a house. The Bible says, when this tent we live in, our body here on earth is torn down, God will have a house in heaven for us to live in, a home he himself has made, which will last forever. While life on earth offers many choices, eternity offers only two, heaven or hell. Your relationship to God on earth will determine your relationship to him in eternity. If you learn to love and trust God's son, Jesus, you will be invited to spend the rest of eternity with him. On the other hand, if you reject his love, forgiveness, and salvation, you will spend eternity apart from God forever. C.S. Lewis said, there are two kinds of people, those who say to God, Thy will be done, and those to whom God says, All right then, have it your way. Tragically, many people will have to endure eternity without God because they choose to live without Him here on earth. When you, uh, when you fully comprehend that there is more to life than just here and now, and you realize that life is just preparation for eternity, you will begin to live differently. You will start living in light of eternity, and that will uh, color how you handle every relationship, task, and circumstance. Suddenly, many activities, goals, and even problems that seem so important will appear trivial, petty, and unworthy of your attention. The closer you live to God, the smaller everything else appears. When you live in light of eternity, your values change. You use your time and money more wisely. You place a higher premium on relationships and character instead of fame and wealth or achievements or even fun. Your priorities are re uh, reordered. Keeping up with trends, fashion, and popular values just doesn't matter as much anymore. Paul said, I once thought all these things were so very important, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. If your time on earth were all there is to your life, I would suggest you start living it up immediately. You could forget being good and ethical, and you wouldn't have to worry about the consequences of your actions. You could indulge yourself in total self-centeredness uh, because your actions would have no long-term repercussions. But, and this makes all the difference, 
Death is not the end of you. Death is not your termination, but your transition into eternity. So there are eternal consequences to everything you do on earth. Every act of our lives strikes some chord that will vibrate in eternity. The most damaging aspect of uh, contemporary living is short-term thinking. To make the most of your life, you must keep the vision of eternity continually in your mind and the value of it in your heart. There's far more to life than just, uh, just here and now. Today is the visible tip of the iceberg. Eternity is all the rest you don't see un underneath the surface. What is it going to be like in eternity with God? Frankly, the capacity of our brain cannot handle the wonder and greatness of heaven. It would be like trying to describe the internet to an ant. It's futile. Words have not been invented that could possibly convey the experience of eternity. The Bible says, no mere man has ever seen, heard, or even imagined what wonderful things God has ready for those who love the Lord. However, God has given us glimpses of eternity in his world, in his word. We know that right now God is preparing an eternal home for us. In heaven we will be reunited with loved ones who are believers, released from all pain and suffering, rewarded for our faithfulness on earth, and reassigned to do work that we will enjoy doing. We won't lie around on clouds with uh, halos playing harps. We will enjoy unbroken fellowship with God, and He will enjoy us for an unlimited, endless forever. One day Jesus will say, Come you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. C.S. Lewis captured the concept of eternity on the last page of the Chronicles of Narnia. His seven-book children's fictional fiction series, for us, this is the end of all the stories, but for them it was only the beginning of the real story. All their life in this world had only been the cover and the title page. Now at last, they were beginning chat the they were beginning chapter, one of the great story, which no one on earth has read, which goes on forever and in which every chapter is better than the one before. God has, uh, ha has a purpose for your life on earth, but it doesn't end here. His plan involves far more than, a, than the few decades you will spend on this planet. It's more than the opportunity of a lifetime. God offers you an opportunity beyond your lifetime. The Bible says, God plans, endures, endure forever. His purpose lasts eternally. The only time most people think about eternity is at funerals, and then it's often shallow, sentimental thinking based on ignorance. You may feel it's morbid to think about death, but actually it's unhealthy to live in denial of death and not consider what is inevitable. Only a fool would go through life unprepared for what he or for what we all know will eventually happen. You need to think more about eternity, not less, just just as the nine months you spent in your mother's womb were not an end in themselves, but preparation for life. So this life is preparation for the, for the next. If you have a relationship with God through Jesus, you don't need to fear death. It is the door to eternity. It will be the last hour of your time on earth, but it won't be the last of you. Rather than being the end of your life, it will be your birth into eternal life. The Bible says this world is not our home, we are looking forward to our everlasting home in heaven. Measured against eternity, our time on earth is just a blink of an eye, but the consequences of it will last forever. The deeds of this life are the destiny of the next. We should be realizing that every moment we spend in these earthly bodies is time spent away from our eternal home in heaven with Jesus. Years ago, a popular slogan encouraged people to live each day as the first day of the rest of their life. 
Actually, it would be wiser to live each day as if it were the last day of your life. Matthew Henry said, it ought to be the business of every day to prepare for our final day. Day four, thinking about my purpose. Point to ponder. There's more to life than just here and now. Verse to remember, this world is fading away along with everything it craves, but if you do the will of God, you will live forever. 1 John 2, full colon 17. Question to consider. Since I was made to last forever, what is the one thing I should stop doing and the one thing I should start doing today? Thanks for joining me. That was uh, day four of our 40-day uh, challenge. Now, the other day, I made a, a, a short video about uh, this right here. I went to Barnes & Noble. Um, I bought, uh, I think, 20 of them all together. And I've since given a few public officials one for themselves. And the reason that I'm doing this is they have a duty to know, and now they have no plausible deniability, okay? Because I'm going to hold them to this. There are many legal scholars out there that tell you that this is frivolous and that it has no meaning and no importance after the Reconstruction Act. I am here to tell you. They may have created a corporation, ladies and gentlemen, but they did not have the power to, to cancel, to stop, or to destroy what already existed before they created, under the Reorganization Act, their corporation, okay? And that's the important of this. So many people out there are saying this doesn't have any force, weight, and effect. I'm here to tell you equivocally that it does. All right, but you have to know how to invoke it and you have to know how to utilize it. All right, this is a wonderful tool in your arsenal. The federal government keeps the state government at bay when they encroach upon your unalienable rights. All right, and this book is what every other constitution, state constitution, was founded upon. Make no mistake about it. The states made their constitution after this was created and enforced, okay? So somebody said, well, what's the importance of it, Derek? I don't understand why you're reading all that nonsensical horse shit. Let me help you out a little bit. Let me just take you to the promised land, all right? Amendments to the Constitution of the United States of America. Congress shall make no laws respecting an establishment of religion. The First Amendment, ladies and gentlemen, is the most important amendment, and the reason for it is, is if it wasn't the, the, the most important, it wouldn't be number one, all right? Religion, your freedom to believe and see things how you wish and desire to see them, or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech, not the liberty of speech, the freedom of speech, or of the press. Ladies and gentlemen, these courthouses that are now telling you that you cannot go in there and record in them, that is an egregious encroachment on your unalienable rights to hold your public officials accountable in a public building because the expectation of privacy does not exist in the public realm. If you're out in the public, donkey dicking off, and I have a camera, you best believe the people around the world are going to see it. All right? There are only two types of people in this world that do not like to be recorded. Porn stars after a long, hot, sweaty day at work, and criminals. The question is, in a courthouse, ain't none of them pretty enough to be porn stars. All right? So, what can we deduce from that statement of fact? They obviously are criminals if they do not wish to be recorded. They will tell you that they are creating a record. So often, when they create a piss poor record, magically, they had technical difficulties that day and we regret to inform you that your uh, request for um, electronics uh, surveillance preservation request, unfortunately, although we would grant it to you, 
we lost the ability to record that day. So we apologize to you. Well, thankfully, if they have a right to create a record, where do you think they got that right from, ladies and gentlemen? They got that right because you have that right as well. So if they're going to tell you you can't record, you need to put your left boot up somebody's ass. Maybe you prefer to step with your right foot first. You can use the right one too. There is no right or wrong way to put a boot up somebody's ass. It'll go up forward. It'll go up sideways. It'll go up backwards. You can do it in a multitude of ways. The choice is yours. But let me give you the ammunition for being able to do so. Of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to the petition to petition the government for redress of grievance. Now, this is so important because everybody's asking me, well, Derek, how in the hell are you getting docket numbers without paying their ransom fee, their extortion fee? I have a right of redress of grievance, ladies and gentlemen. The courts uh, are open to the American people 24 hours a day and seven days a week, so long as you understand the authority from which that derives, okay? Now, a lot of gurus out there going, oh, that stuff don't work. Now, I'm living proof. There's a man watching right now that knows damn good and well it can be done because he watched me do it not more than a week ago. Told me, Dirk, it took us longer to walk in this damn building than it did to get the docket number, and they didn't even try and charge you. Isn't that amazing? So the proof is in the pudding. Let's go on to the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment, a well-regulated militia, ladies and gentlemen, if you have a set of testicles, and you're swinging a piece of meat between your legs, let me inform you of something. From the age of 18 to the age of 65, you are part of the militia, whether you know it or you don't, okay? And you should rightfully be uh, deriving a check month after month after month from the United States government for services rendered. What do I mean by that? You are on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Should America come under attack, they have the right to call you into action, and because you're on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, you should be getting a check. A well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, all right? The right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Only an educated idiot would try and work around the word infringed, and trust me, I see it happen all the time. Lawyers, oh, well, you know, firearms. Well, first of all, I don't define my arms by your federally defined terms, period. That's my property. It's the property of I. And if you encroach upon my property without just compensation, which we'll get to in this book just in a little while, then we're going to have an issue. All right? I have a right to defend my friends my family, and to live peacefully and sensibly, all while being secure. And you will not take my tactical defense tools from me. It will never fucking happen. Amendment number three. No soldier shall, in time of peace, be quartered in any house without the consent of the owner, nor in time of war, but in a manner to be prescribed by law. Ladies and gentlemen, when agents and agency put their foot in your fucking door, you are housing them at that point. And you have a right not to quarter any soldier, whether in time of peace or time of war. Right? And commerce, make no mistake about it, is a time of war. And you can absolutely enforce the Third Amendment in the federal court system when you have some gun-toting moron who thinks policy trumps law under the color of law and gives him the opportunity and ability to force his way into your house. Absent a warrant, absent probable cause, and absent a reasonable, articulable fucking fact to be in your humble abode. It's called the Castle Doctrine. Not only the Castle Doctrine, but we also have this book right here that tells you the truth. That tells you they are forbidden from doing so. And if they do so, they are 100% liable in their personal capacity because they are operating outside their scope of their authority. Hear me well. Amendment 4. 
The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures, okay, shall not be violated. I better read that one again. We ain't even got through the whole thing, and I feel like we need to just rewind just a second and come back to it. The Fourth Amendment, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, any contract you create, driver's license, paperwork, all those are persons. Every time you sign your name to something, you create another person, all right? <clears throat> Houses, any humble abode you may have that you dwell in, that's your house. You have a right to be secure in it. Papers, all your paperwork, anything that has your name on it, anything you created, you have a right to be secure in and affects anything. Uh, as far as, uh, let's say you buy a house and you plant a tree, that tree becomes an effect of your dwelling, okay? It's something that you put life source energy into. You have a right to an agricultural lien to protect that tree. You have a right to, to uh, protect your effects, okay? Against unreasonable searches and seizure. What constitutes unreasonable, ladies and gentlemen? Well, first of all, if they're going to get a warrant, the warrant has to have an upraised seal. There has to be sufficient pleadings, okay, sworn to, verifiable, not validated, verifiable, which means the man or the woman making the claim has to do so in front of a notary or competent witnesses and affix his signature there to facing one year in jail and a $10,000 penalty. All right. He has to affirm. He has to put his testicles on the chopping block. He has to put something up because he's bringing a claim against you and you carry unlimited liability. So the one bringing the claim against you must also bear the same. That's equal protection of the law. Hear me well. Shall not be violated. Ladies and gentlemen, these people violate you every fucking day. No reasonable articulable facts, no reasonable articulable suspicion, no mens rea, no malium inse, no malium prohibitum, no corpus delecti. These people piss on your back every day and try and convince you it's fucking raining. And I'm here to tell you that you have the power to put your boot up their ass any way you see fit. There are things far worse than death, ladies and gentlemen. Leaving somebody destitute for their dereliction of duty their breach of your peace is far greater than having somebody swing from the end of a fucking rope. One, you get to go to bed at night with a clear conscience knowing that you didn't end one of God's creation's life, all right? One of your fellow man. You didn't do that. You're not responsible for it, okay? And the other thing is, two, that tyrant isn't out there bothering any of your brothers and sisters anymore because he doesn't have two nickels to rub together to put in a fuel tank to go harass anybody. So you've done your civic duty for your fellow brothers and sisters. You stood up for your rights, which ensured that nobody else would be bothered by that same gun-toting moron or that same black robe priest sitting on a bench or that same lying, looting, pandering piece of shit prosecutor who falsified a record all under the guise that he was administering justice on behalf of his client. You listening? You paying attention? And no warrant shall issue but upon probable cause supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the person or things to be seized. How often do we see these alleged warrants? And I call them alleged warrants because I know what they are. They're capiuses. A capius is not a warrant. It may resemble a warrant, but it's much like the color of law. It just resembles a warrant. It isn't actually a warrant. Because what does a warrant require? An upraised seal, not a rubber stamp, okay? It requires an actual wet ink signature and an affidavit or a statement of fact that launch to it as well as a hazard bond attached to it. Oh, 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 oh shit. Letting the cat out of the bag today. James Bethel, I was on the phone with him last night. And he goes, dude, you are getting so good. If you don't stop, they will kill you just so you know.
that I welcome that day because I am ready to leave this fucking place. I'm ready. I'll speak truth until they take the wind out of my sails or the wind out of my lungs. I will bring it hard-hitting and true and factual to the best of my ability every fucking day for the rest of my life. And I'm not going to stop just because <clears throat> the inevitable may happen. People go, well, Derek, uh, you know, that's pretty morbid. JFK, whack. Uh, 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 Nixon, they just pretended to whack him. You know, they uh, went ahead and hired some drunk from the bar to do it. That was just a warning shot, okay? Abe Lincoln, smoked, okay? We could go on for days and days and days. Recently, there are people, there were presidents in other countries that weren't going to go along with the PCR test, all right? They got whacked. They got smoked. They said they weren't going to force vaccinate their population. They got euthanized. You guys didn't even hear about that shit on, uh, on the national news or international news or anything, but it's a fact. So go do your research and you'll see what I'm talking about. The shit that, that many, myself and many others are doing uh, comes at a great price. All right? Freedom isn't free and I'm not going to stand around and watch these fucking lion looting pattern pieces of shit take advantage of you guys anymore. All right? Warrant shall issue, but upon what probable cause... Okay, not a, uh, not a, uh, 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 well, I, I suspect that he's doing something. Probable cause requires somebody who witnessed something who's willing to put it down on an affidavit and it's two or more witnesses. One witness does not suffice. It tells us in the Bible, two or more witnesses must affirm the same identical story in order to yield probable cause. One does not suffice. Supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the person or things to be seized. Amendment 5. No person shall be held to answer for a capital or otherwise infamous crime, unless on presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising in the land or naval forces or in, a, in the militia when an actual service in time of war or public danger, nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb. You know, I keep talking to you about that unlimited liability. It's so important that you understand what that is because unlimited liability, let me just explain it to you. An order of a court can be enforced with lethal intent. Do you understand the ramifications of what I just stated to you? A court order can, be, can be enforced with lethal force. That's unlimited liability, even unto death. If the state is bringing a claim against you, can we lay the state to death? Does it have a heartbeat? Does it have a pulse? Can, we, can the state do anything in good faith with honor and integrity? Can you have a meeting of the minds with the state? Do they carry the same unlimited liability you do even unto death? The answer to that, ladies and gentlemen, is no. Because a corporation has limited liability. Why limited? Because it's limited by its assets. The second its assets are gone, there is no more liability. Because it's not worth anything at that point, ladies and gentlemen. All right. Nor shall he be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law. Nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. In the 21st century, ladies and gentlemen, all property is vested in the United States. And that's what makes the President of the United States primarily liable by default for all debts under Title 18, subsection 8. You want to claim to have control over everything? Then you foot the fucking bill for everything, dickhead. All right? It's that simple. That simple. All right? But here's the other thing. We have private property. It's ours. We have a right to be compensated for its use. Somebody said the other day, Derek, 
somebody takes your automobile because you're traveling without plates and, and without registration and insurance and they take your private uh, property, um, you know, and you go to jail, what are you going to do? I'm going to send them a true bill to an owing and in 90 days I'm going to collect on that. Chances are I'm going to go buy three brand new automobiles nicer than the one they took from me because they didn't ask how much it was going to cost them when they took it. They were on the, the presumption and assumption that they had the authority under the color of law to rob me. That's robbery. It's armed robbery. It's theft by way of taking. And that trumps any statute, code, city ordinance, rule, or regulation they have created. And my claim of theft will absolutely destroy the basis they stand upon for the reason that they did what they did. All I need is your lawful excuse as to why you uh, caused I, a man, harm by way of robbery. And at that time, if you cannot provide a lawful excuse, I am rightfully entitled to everything you once thought was yours. Best believe it. <clears throat> in cases arising in the land... Where were we at? We'll just start out with uh, the Fourth Amendment. Yeah. No person shall be held to answer for a capital crime or otherwise infamous crime unless on presentment or indictment of a grand jury, except in cases arising out of land or naval forces or in the militia, when in actual service in time of war or public danger, nor shall any person be subject for the same offense to be twice put in jeopardy of life or limb, nor shall he be compelled in any criminal case to be a witness against himself, nor be deprived of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. The Sixth Amendment. In all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to, be, to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law, and to be informed of the nature and cause of the action. Ladies and gentlemen, they always tell us the cause. They will never tell you the nature. They will never Put a true bill due and owing before you in a form of a presentment. You can't have a debt without a true bill due and owing, just like you can't have a crime without a man or a woman claiming harm, damage, or loss for which you could provide remedy. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? I'm telling you 99.9% .9 of alleged crimes that they're prosecuting people for are not in fact criminal in any way, shape, or form. Are you hearing what I'm telling you? I hope so. I'm not the most brilliant man in the world. I'm gonna tell you what, you kick me around long enough and eventually I'm gonna get a hold of your fucking little toe and I'm gonna drag you around the parking lot and beat your lily ass. That's what's gonna happen, all right? And that's what happened to me. I got beat up by a bunch of intellectual jackasses who are lying, looting, pandering pieces of shit and I got up and dusted myself off and I stuck into that damn fight because I knew in my heart they were doing wrong. And I'll be damned if you're going to piss on my back and convince me it's raining and get away with it. And now, after a great amount of study, a lot of prayer, a lot of self-reflection, I now have the intellectual superior knowledge to hold these people accountable. And I wish to give it and share it to you freely here on Facebook to the best of my ability to plant the seeds to help you start to think about what actions need to be taken in order to preserve your community, to help your friends, your family, your neighbors, all right? That's why I'm doing what I'm doing today. To be confronted with the witnesses against him, to have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor, and to have the assistance of counsel for his defense. Now, there are a couple things within this book that aren't being said because they go without fucking saying. Now everybody says, well, Derek, where did you get the right to face your accuser? Because in here it just says witnesses. If you're asking me that question, I, ugh, it pains me greatly. All right. 
Because without an accuser, ladies and gentlemen, your witnesses are bold-faced, lying, looting, pandering pieces of shit. Are we clear? Can I get a roger that? All right. It goes without saying. We get to the Tenth Amendment, I'm going to explain some stuff to you a little greater. We get the Eighth and the Ninth Amendment, we explain some stuff even greater that will help you comprehend that the Sixth Amendment, although it doesn't say you have the right to face your accuser, it goes without fucking saying. Because without an accuser, there are no fucking witnesses. To have compulsory process for obtaining witnesses in his favor the right of discovery, the right of full disclosure, the right to depose the claimant, and to have the assistance of counsel. Notice I didn't say a lawyer. You have a right to a learned man at law, or woman at law, in law, to stand next to you in court and to assist you in navigating such treacherous waters where they use trickery to fuck you out of your estates. For his defense, the Seventh Amendment, here we go, this is a beautiful one. If you're attending the class on November 13th, 2021 at 1 p.m., this is what we're about to get into, the Seventh Amendment. In suits at the common law, where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of trial by jury shall be preserved. Not jury trial. These people did not make mistakes in what they wrote. I want to be clear about it. In suits at the common law. Now, I understand the Judicature Act of the 1800s. I get it. Okay? I know what they did. I know what a lot of gurus are telling you and misleading you down the wrong path, saying that the Judicature Act blended statutes and codes and equity. What they're not telling you, because either they haven't done a great amount of due diligence or they just simply overlooked it, which these things do happen. I've been known to project things incorrectly and I do my best to come back to you as quick as I can to correct the record. I once had the same thought process as these people. Oh, well, they blended equity and, and, and the code. They blended it together and they administer equity and the code simultaneously now. Incorrect assessment. They use Roman civil equity and they use Roman civil law and code, okay? That was the Judicature Act where they blended it together. And you want to know why they blended it together? To emulate and simulate the exclusive jurisdiction of equity because the, the public venue is very jealous of equity. They always have been. I mean, it is the most eloquent thing you've ever seen. It's like seeing greatness and striving to achieve it. You may never fully achieve it, but you'll always try to be like it, right? That's what they're doing under the Judicature Act. The Roman civil maxims are like this. Let he who wishes to be ignorant remain ignorant. Does that sound godly to you? Does that sound like fulfilling the Heavenly Father's purpose and being about his good works that you're gonna let your fellow man wander around this earth ignorant? doesn't sound that way to me. It doesn't strike my heart that way. So, in suits at common law, where the value in controversy shall exceed $20, the right of a trial by jury, not jury trial, two distinct venues and two very separate jurisdictions shall be preserved, period, never to be changed, never to be fucking altered. I don't care if tomorrow morning they decide to create the Ringling Brothers Circus fucking court. The common law venue will never fucking change and the right to a trial by way of jury is cemented until the end of time. It's a beautiful thing. It's always going to be preserved. And no fact tried but it uh, by a jury shall be otherwise examined in any court of the United States than according to the rules of the common law. Let's talk about 
trial by jury, just for a brief moment. There are general verdicts, and then there are these nifty little things that Jesuits came up with called special verdicts. A general verdict, the jury decides whether the law is fair, true, reasonable, and accurate, and they also decide what the facts are. Now, in a special verdict, you have one of these little Jesuitical assholes, cross-dressing sons of bitches, wearing a black dress on a bench, trying to act like a man, all while lording over the incompetent, okay, who will instruct the jury of the law, and then turn around and tell the jury, you decide the facts. And in a special verdict, if the judge doesn't approve of what the jury has rendered for a decision, he can order them back into the, 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 the juror room and tell them to come out with an answer he agrees with. Does that sound like justice to you, or does that sound like a lying, looting, panting piece of shit trying to line the pockets of his fellow bar association members by administering a bankruptcy? You decide. All I can do is plant the seed. That's for you to decide. A special verdict can be overturned by a higher court. A general verdict can never be challenged. Amendment 8. Excessive bail and bond shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishment inflicted. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are innocent until proven guilty, what are you doing sitting in a fucking cage? By what authority do these jackasses operate in prohibiting you from building an adequate defense to fend for yourself by putting you in a cage and requiring some type of fiat to remove yourself from that cage? Excessive bail and bond shall not be required nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishment inflicted. That is not only found in the federal constitution as an amendment, ladies and gentlemen, the Eighth Amendment, it is also found in every state constitution throughout the United States of America and the Union of States Constitution as well. There are different constitutions out there, but it's in every one of them. If you don't know your rights and you slumber on your rights, you don't have any. For all you guys out there that are saying, oh, Derek, you're reading that, that book, and that doesn't have any significance, I'm going to tell you right now, this book is one powerful son of a bitch. The only book probably more powerful in this country than this book right here is that Holy Bible sitting over there next to my computer. And it's not probably. It's the only book that is more powerful than this book right here as far as we're concerned in, in, in the United States. The Ninth Amendment. This is where shit gets good and shit gets real, all right? Now, one through 10 was before they did the Act of 1871. One through 10, all right? One through 10 in the Constitution, as far as amendments and the Bill of Rights, are the most powerful, in my humble opinion. I don't use the 14th Amendment. I don't use their crackpot bullshit 13th Amendment that they revised after the burning of Virginia because they thought we were all too fucking stupid to realize what they had done. All right, if you really educate yourself, you realize the 13th Amendment bars esquires from holding titles of nobility and public fucking office. Period. End of story. They give you 13th Amendment is where slavery was ended. Bullshit. That wasn't the 13th Amendment. All right, that may be their version of the 13th Amendment and their charter, their banking charter constitution, but that was not the intent of the original 13th Amendment. Now we get to nine. Nine is one of my favorite. The enumeration in the constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the fucking people. Now, it doesn't say fucking in there. I'm ad-libbing a little bit, but it sounds really fucking good. 
Do you know what the Ninth Amendment preserves for you? Okay? An unalienable right you already had. It didn't call for you any rights. It didn't grant you any rights. It didn't give you any rights. It preserved them. It drew a line in the sand saying, fuck you, here's to me. Pull your head out of your ass. I know this is a big one to swallow. All right? The enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage others retained by the people. There are the enumerated, ladies and gentlemen, and then there, there, there are the unenumerated. There are the tangible, ladies and gentlemen, and then there, there are the intangibles, ladies and gentlemen. Now, the intangibles sometimes, the unobtainables, the ones you can't taste, feel, touch, or smell, are at most often the ones that carry the most power, the most punch, the most bang for your buck. This book does not give me any fucking rights at all. There are no constitutional rights that exist. You got to get that damn thought process out your head. You don't have constitutional rights. You never have. You never will. And you need to get right with it because you need to get right with the Lord because the truth is you have unalienable rights, ladies and gentlemen. This book is so important. Become a Luke 20 man. Become a Luke, or a Genesis 126 man. That's right. Stand up and realize where your authority comes from. Because this book here is what helped create this one. All right? The enumerated and the unenumerated. Let's go through some enumerated. You have the right to bear arms. Uh, you have the right not to be... Uh, 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 um, Cruel and unusual punishment. You have a right that's established in here that's written down uh, not to have excessive bail and bond. Let's go through some of your unenumerated rights. You have the right to urinate, defecate, masticate, masturbate, uh, inhale, exhale, all right? You have a right to shake your tail at the moon, okay? Unenumerated. Granted to you by the Heavenly Father. They cannot be altered by man or taken by anybody, but they can be usurped. If you enter into contract, and this book tells you about the contract, it tells you that if you enter into a contract, so long as it's not unconsciousable, God expects you to honor it and fulfill your contractual obligation, even if you make that contract with the devil. And the only way out of it, the only way out of that contract is if it's unconsciousable. Now, in commercial law, if you discover that it's not mutually beneficial, you also have a way out of that contract. It's about knowing who you are, ladies and gentlemen. And I hope that I'm doing my damnedest and my finest presentation to help you see this, all right? As the Ninth Amendment, I always get a little bit of spiritual lifting there. Here comes number 10. And this is another one of my favorites. The power not delegated to the United States by the Constitution. What's this book doing again? They just told you. The power is not delegated to the United States by the Constitution. This book is what's giving them their authority. And when they're operating outside of this book, we're going to tap that ass. We're going to tap that ass financially because it's the only thing they care about. We're going to leave them financially destitute. And at the end of the day... We can rest our head on our pillow in good conscience, with good faith, and for good reason, knowing that we didn't take another man's life because of his ignorance. We didn't gun him down in the street. We didn't hang him up in a tree. We can go to bed peacefully on his wallet. We can sleep soundly on his fiat that he thought he amassed throughout his years of extorting and fleecing other fellow Americans, all right? And we can do that with a clean and crystal clear conscience. Amen. The power not delegated to the United States by the Constitution or prohibited by it to the states are reserved to the states respectively or to the people. Or to the people. Ladies and gentlemen, the state isn't real. The state is a body of politic. It's, in a, it's a figment of man's creation. So what is it really saying here? That the power is not delegated 
to the government are the peoples. They're reserved by the people. That's you and I. Amendment number 11, 11th Amendment, was ratified February 7th, 1795. The judicial power of the United States shall not be construed to extend to any suit in law or equity commenced or prosecuted against one of the United States by citizens of another state or by citizen citizens or subjects of any foreign state. I like myself to prosecute these assholes in their personal capacity, but I'm going to go on to elaborate on this because after the Reorganization Act, after the Federal Reserve Banking Act of 1913 implemented and fully put into swing in 1933 and commenced after 1977, finally removing, or 71, removing the gold standard, I know that when government operates outside of its scope of authority and does business, B-U-S-I-N-E-S-S, -S -S, business, like any other common man, they can sue and be sued, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, it's really important for you to understand that. The 12th Amendment was ratified June 15, 1804. The electors shall meet in their respe uh, respective states and vote by ballot for president and vice president, one of whom at least shall not be an inhabitant of the same state with themselves. They shall name in their ballots the person voted for as president and in district ballots the person voted for as vice president and they shall make distinct lists of all persons voted for as president and of all persons voted for as vice president and for and of the number of votes for each which list they shall sign and certify and transmit sealed to be uh, to s sealed to the seat of the government of the United States directed to the president of the Senate the president of the Senate shall in the presence of the Senate and House of Representatives open all the certificates and the votes shall then be counted we're going to come back a little bit later on I get a little excited I'm starting to lose my voice and I have calls all day back to back to back today I hope this little presentation helps you out. I got this little ditty at Barnes & Noble. It also has the Declaration of Independence included in it. And uh, it also has a, a tremendous uh, bit of history in here, some of which I agree with, some of it has been heavily skewed. Um, but get an opportunity to get one of these at Barnes & Noble, let me know. I have, I have six that I'm willing to mail to you, one per person, Privately message me your address, and because of your guys' support, I will send out six of these. I'm going to keep a few because I have some uh, public officials I want to make sure they have it in their hands so they have no plausible deniability of not knowing their rights, titles, duties, and obligations to the American people. But I have six of them. So if you're one of the viewers today and you want one of these books, I only have six, first come, first serve, private message me. If you put your damn address on this video, you ain't getting one. Follow direction. You private message me your address, and I will get it in the mail today. And you will see that I'm a man of my word, because you will be able to see the postmark on the envelope, and it will have today's date on it. What is today's date? November what? 9th? November 10th, 2021. That's what this will be postmarked as, in the mail being sent to you. I got six of them. The first six, the private message me. I'm going to take them in the order as they come. I am going to send you one of these. Have a great day. Thanks for joining me. And as always, tomorrow, we will do a little more out of this book, uh, speaking to our purpose, what our purpose is. All right? So God bless. I love you all. Freedom isn't free. Let's stick it to them. It's time to stand up and fight like hell. Love you guys.